I know a lot of y'all enjoy horror and ghost stories, but I'm putting that on hold for this week. Although I've been uploading quite a bit of horror stories on here, I also wanted to say pocket-sized tales isn't genre-specific. So for this week, I'm doing things a bit differently. The idea for this story came about in light of Sunisa Lee's recent successes. Most, if not all, of y'all may already be familiar with Sunisa and her accomplishments if you've been following the Olympics this year. As much as I'd love to elaborate on this, there are many channels that do a better job at it than me. The best one I've seen so far was from the Fung Bros. The link to that video is in the description below. What I wanted to focus on is her story because it's a very compelling one. Sunisa's story, I feel like, is one the Hmong and many Southeast Asians can relate to as we don't fit into the Asian model minority myth. More details on that in the link in the description below. Not all of us can relate to crazy rich Asians, which I've never seen, by the way. Sunisa's story should be an inspiration to us, so if you have dreams or goals, you should be inspired to pursue them. Sunisa is proof that we have it within ourselves to overcome our circumstances. It will not be easy, but no matter what you're going through or what you've been through, you can overcome the adversities life has in store with hard work and determination. Anyway, this is a topic I can talk about for hours, but I know that's not why you're here, so let's get on with the story. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. To whom it may concern. Hey, my name is Ping Su. My parents immigrated to the U.S. during the 70s as refugees due to the Vietnam conflict. We never had a car because neither of my parents learned to drive. We either had to call our relatives for rides or take the city bus everywhere. We mainly chose the latter since we didn't want to be a nuisance to anyone. My parents also didn't work. They barely spoke a word of English. Like many others in similar situations, we were on government assistance via welfare, Section 8, Medicaid, Medicare, and food stamps. It's true when they say ignorance is bliss. I didn't even know what government assistance was or what it consisted of as a child. I didn't have any concept of bills or rent either. At the time, I had no idea what it meant to be poor or rich, but my siblings and I were happy. What more could we ask for? We had food to eat, clothes to wear, and toys to play with. Although the toys probably weren't new or the best ones, we loved them just as much because we didn't know any better. We were content for the most part. Life was much simpler back then. I thought everyone was like us, meaning parents were just at home with their kids unless they were at school. I never heard of the concept of a job or having to work until I got older. Life went on like that for a while as my siblings and I indulged ourselves in the innocent bliss of our childhood. I thought it would last forever. Unfortunately, it did not, as tragedy struck my family one day. I still remember that infamous day like it was yesterday. My school was literally across the street from our house. It was recess, and I was in the schoolyard engaged in a game of cops and robbers with all my friends when I heard the sirens coming from around the corner. I turned to look and saw an ambulance pull up to the front of our house. The EMTs rushed out bringing the stretcher with them to the front door. I stopped mid-chase and my attention focused on the scene unfolding across the street as I involuntarily made my way toward it. The other kids and teachers have also started to form a crowd by the fence. What happened? A boy from the crowd asked. Oh my, I hope they're okay, a female teacher gasped aloud with a hand on her chest. Someone got hurt, a girl cried from somewhere on my left. The gasps and chit-chat continued, but my mind was distracted, flooded by a million things to notice what was being discussed. About 20 minutes later, the MTs came out of our house carting someone toward the ambulance. Following behind them was my mom. She was in tears. My heart dropped. Everything went silent at that point. The murmurs of onlookers were drowned out by the pounding of my heart. I fought my way to the front of the crowd. 
The huge knot in my throat made it hard to swallow, and I began hyperventilating. It can't be Dad. Please don't let it be him, I said to myself over and over. I knew he had been sick for some time, and had been in and out of the hospital constantly. My vision blurred from the overflowing sea of tears around my eyes. As hard as I fought them back, I couldn't stop them from coming. When I got to the front of the crowd, my worst fears became true. Dad was lying motionless on a stretcher. His eyes were closed. He had an IV put on him and an oxygen mask over his nose and mouth. I barely saw him for a second before the EMTs shut the doors. I hopped the fence and sprinted toward the ambulance as I cried out, Dad! Don't go! Wait for me! Stop! Get back here! A nearby teacher shouted and tried to grab me, but she couldn't get to me in time. The ambulance drove away with lights and sirens blaring. Mom stood there, alone, crying, as she watched it disappear around the corner. I raced across the street into my mom's arms, breaking into a full-on cry. I bawled like I've never bawled before. As mom held and rubbed the top of my head, she said, My son, don't cry. Your dad will certainly get better. I said nothing. I wanted to do as she said, but I couldn't help myself from keeping the tears at bay. That was the last time I saw my dad until the funeral. He passed away a few weeks after that day. My siblings and I never saw him at the hospital. All the adults said he was in really bad shape and did not want to scare us. I was nine years old when my dad died. After that, we were practically left to fend for ourselves. We walked and took the bus everywhere. It didn't matter if it rained or shined. I became my mom's personal translator and helper. I was suddenly tossed into the real world before I was ready. As time went on, I became more aware of my situation, and I grew bitter at the unjust treatment life dealt my family. As I overheard conversations from other kids about going on trips with their parents, getting new toys, clothes, and electronic devices, I was sad because I knew it was something I could never relate to. Gone was the carefree child who had no responsibilities nor concept of bills. I hardly ever asked my mom for anything anymore unless it was absolutely necessary. Every so often, while we were running errands, we'd stop by a shop or store, and when we passed by the toys or candy section, Mom would ask, Did you want anything? I can get it for you. No, I always said. I didn't want her to spend money on me in case we needed it for bills or food. If anything, I'd rather she got something for my younger siblings instead. That was how I was up until middle school and through the beginning of high school. Those were tumultuous times for me. Our relatives didn't care about the family. We were seen as exiles, and they never invited us to gatherings after Dad died. Nothing was said they didn't need to be, because I felt the difference. With nowhere to fit in, I eventually befriended a Cambodian kid named Aaron. He had family members affiliated with gang culture. They welcomed me, and I was practically family to them. The more I hung out with them, the more I participated in their activities, both legal and illegal. It started with minor theft, and as I continued to prove myself, I took on more responsibilities. Suffice it to say, Aaron and the gang took care of me during that time. They provided me with money for new clothes, shoes, and electronics. I was still able to buy food with the money I had left over. When I got to high school, my reputation among the gang increased. I made more money, and even started getting more popularity around the school. Although I didn't really do drugs, all the money I made and attention got to my head. I started missing school, and my grades suffered. Some of my cousins knew the guys I was hanging with, and eventually the news got to my mom. We got into a huge fight, and she cried. 
You broke my heart. I'll never forget those words. Mom said, I only have four of you, and you're the oldest. You don't even have a father anymore. I thought I taught you better. Maybe I failed as a parent. This would never happen if your father were still around. I cried as I hugged my mom and said, I'm so sorry, Mom. Don't blame yourself. I'm stupid and a bad son. You're a great mother, and I don't deserve to be your son. From this day forward, I will change. However, it was easier said than done, as I still had obligations to the gang. I got into several skirmishes with rival gang members. One of those situations involved guns. Mom and I had another fight when she heard about it. She then called my aunt from out of state to work out an arrangement. We moved away within that week. I never heard from Aaron and the gang after that. Like before, our aunts and uncles there didn't show us any respect. It seems like my siblings and I were always being judged and compared with their own kids. My reputation for gang culture certainly didn't help matters, and I could understand that. But what I couldn't understand was own people's lack of respect for orphan kids or widowed families. It was as if they think they could disrespect us like we don't have any feelings. Obviously, I wasn't culture-oriented since I never go to the gatherings and there wasn't anyone to teach me. So I wasn't privy to a lot of the nuances that came with the Hmong culture. Yet these elders would make snarky comments about how I should know it all. The other thing was them saying how we'd never amount to anything without fatherly guidance. I felt like there was a reason why the Hmong have the saying, If you weren't my son or daughter, I would never teach you. All of that became a recurring theme during my teenage years and beyond. I lived most of my life being underestimated, and it no longer fazed me anymore. I had a relative tell me once, You're going to be a bum, and I feel sorry for your mother. She should have just gotten remarried because she has no future with you kids. Then there was a lady that had the audacity to say to my mom, I will not let our daughters marry your sons. They are culturalists and without guidance. I don't want our daughters suffering in a poor family. If she only knew what her daughter was capable of, but I wasn't going to say anything. With that, I made a vow to myself to achieve more than any of the kids they compared me to, and it would be something to throw in the face of my haters. Even if it was the last thing I did, I would not let my family's name be dishonored by these assholes. We lived with an aunt and uncle of ours until we found a Section 8 rental. With my newfound determination to be self-reliant fueling me, I found a part-time job and focused on my academics. Whenever I made money, most of it was given to my mom for bills and food. As before, walking was still my primary means of transportation so I'd have to walk to school and work with my books and a change of clothing. I busted my ass until I was able to save enough for my first car in early 2001. It was a used 1996 Nissan Sentra with close to 100,000 miles. My family was so happy they'd never have to walk again. I actually had prior experience driving while I hung out with Aaron and the gang, so driving the car wasn't an issue. I graduated from high school the next year with honors. It was fairly easy, I might add. I continued on to a community college. After obtaining the necessary credits, I transferred over to a four-year university. I also continued working all the while attending school. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but after lots of sacrifices and countless late-night study sessions, I finally graduated with a bachelor's degree in information systems, and the rest was history. I am now a man in my late thirties. I have a family, a house, and two cars. I also have a career working for the number one children's hospital in the region. I love what I do and find my work very fulfilling. For vacations, I've traveled outside the United States a few times and visited almost half of the states in the US. I know what you're probably thinking. So what? And why should you care? Don't get me wrong, this isn't to boast. All the things I listed probably don't mean much to you, but to me it means everything. This means I was successful in my dreams and goals. Being successful can mean different things from person to person, 
For me, it meant making sure my family is taken care of and being able to travel and vacation when and wherever I pleased. Then when I retire, I can leave not only my wisdom, but also my finances so my children do not struggle. I may never be a billionaire nor famous, but that is okay, because being rich and famous isn't my definition of success. My achievements did not come easy, and I started from humble beginnings. As you can see, I had to overcome many hardships, with little to no help. All my siblings have decent jobs now. They have their own place, and families too. Looking back, many of the kids we were compared to by those adults back then never amounted to anything, even though they had more advantages than us. Mom couldn't have been prouder of our accomplishments. With the shit I put her through and the shit she dealt with from our relatives, this is the least I could do for her, as well as myself. So I am deciding to pay it forward and share my story in hopes that it will aid you in seeing beyond the walls built by your circumstances and rise above it. In return, I hope you'll pay it forward and help those in need in whatever way you can. Remember, you are the author of your own book. You can't write how your story begins, but you can damn sure write how it ends. So don't be just another statistic. Take it from a person that has been through it all. Don't ever let your circumstances and past dictate your future.